Caught in the mind fit The fuel to the fire Ain't nobody can stop it Get trouble in my city But you know I'm across it Got a 40 on my hip And I'm liable to spark it Throw down these hits My click is indivisible I aim you duck I squeeze Now you invisible I'm not afraid of getting physical All these different chemicals Are fogging up my visuals Bloods on my hands Got slugs on my gunners Yo we notorious We ain't no runners Bloods on my hands Got slugs on my gunners Yo we some warriors They ain't caught gunners Bloods on my hands Got slugs on my gunners Bloods on my hands, got slugs on my gunners Put on my sweat, put on the pee, put on the mat, put on my team Take out every motherfucker in between, know what I mean? Better myself, better my aim, better my breath, better my name Killing rappers on my hang, I'm but they chase for the fame Never thought I would and now I'm running You don't wanna follow me, no motherfucking point Good evening, good evening, and welcome to another broadcast of Kidney Disease Education Show with Steve the Kidney Nurse. I'm your host, Steve the Kidney Nurse. So tonight, we got a great show for you. I mean, we know the impact that kidney disease has on people today. And we're going to talk to one of those individuals who happens to do uh, peritoneal dialysis. Now, you might say, hey, what's peritoneal dialysis, Steve? Well, that's one of the treatment options that's used to treat kidney failure. Now, with peritoneal dialysis, uh, peritoneal dialysis uses the lining of the abdominal cavity to clean your blood. Uh, the membrane of the abdominal cavity acts like a filter to remove the fluids and waste from your body. Uh, this lining is called the peritoneal membrane. Now, it holds organs like your intestines, your liver, and stomach in place. Now, let me tell you, one advantage of peritoneal dialysis is that you can do it at home. You don't have to go in no clinics other than when you first start to train, but you could do this at home and have total control over your treatment. It also allows your schedule to be more flexible, especially if you're working. Because we know for many patients that go in center, that could be a problem trying to adjust their work schedule to fit their dialysis schedule. Now, with peritoneal dialysis, a special cleaning fluid called dialysate goes into the abdominal through the catheter. Um, the fluid stays in the abdomen for, about, for a few hours, then it's drained out of the abdomen. And then new fluid is put in, and this is done about four times a day. And then in some cases, they have a machine 
that uses this that makes the exchanges for you at night. So with that being said, let's welcome uh, Zach Love here. Let me give him the VIP intro. How you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Thanks for coming on uh, Kidney Disease Education Moment. I definitely yeah. appreciate you taking the time out. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, look, right now you're doing treatment as we speak. I am, yes. So, explain to us before we, you know, get started with the interview, how how this works with your peritoneal dialysis treatment. So for me, I do um, my treatment at night. I do it six nights, six nights a week, eight hours each day. So I fill up. It sits in my stomach for like an hour and thirty. It drains, and it does it. It does it for a total of five times. So that's how I do my treatment. Okay. Wow. So let's let's talk about how we got here tonight um you are a uh, creative makeup artist and director yes so were you doing that before uh you got kidney disease yes i was yes you were so let's go back to that what inspired you to become involved in creative work such as makeup artistry and directing um despite what was going on or was, you know, going on in your life right now? I would say my creativity has, it had to come from um, my grandparents on my mom and dad's side, because on my mom's side, everybody was either hairstylists, barbers, carpenters, dressmakers. And some people on my daddy's side were either in the tech world or just doing something creative. So I was just born with it. It just came naturally to me. Mm-hmm. Now, when did you find out you had kidney disease? We were talking backstage and you mentioned that you had high blood pressure. Now, how long have you had high blood pressure? I've had high blood pressure since like 25, 26, but I'm going to have a transparent moment too. I believe that when I contracted um, HIV, that has something to do with it as well. Okay. Because the medicine that I was taking as well, a tripler, they pulled it off and didn't tell us why they pulled it off the shelf. Wow. Okay. Okay. So, um, high blood pressure, you said you had about 25 years? I, I, no, it started when I was 25. Oh, when you was 25? Yes. And so, how, how did you find out? Is it when you went to the doctor or like a checkup? And they told you you had high blood pressure. How did you find out you had high blood pressure? I was always getting headaches, um, dizzy, uh, lethargic. I was just always dizzy and having headaches. But I didn't eat properly either because I was always on the go, working from this job to that job and not taking care of myself. So you was eating a lot of carryout food? Yes, carry out food, junk food, energy drinks, all the stuff that's not good for you. Mm. Do you think that had a, a, a impact on your high blood pressure? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so when you found out you had high blood pressure, did, they, did your doctor uh, prescribe you medication? Yes. My first physician prescribed me medication and she didn't really listen to me. So I stopped taking the medicine. <laughs> hmm. And I mean, you stopped taking it 
it, did you ever get back on it? I did, yes. I got back on it. Um, when I I went to, I was sick for about maybe a week and I was just thrown up for like three days straight. This is when I, I was working out of town. I was in Arizona actually doing training for when I was working at the airport and I was sick then. So by the time I came home, I was sick the whole time on the plane ride home. And three days after that, I just called 911. And um, when the ambulance came and got me, you know, they did my vitals and they had me in the room. The lady was like, I've never seen nobody's blood pressure this high and they're still able to function. Mm. How high was it? it? It was so high to where I had to go into, um, I was in ICU. That sound like that was probably over 200. Yes. Wow. When when you look back over that situation, do you regret stop taking a medicine like that? This is not so regret. I just wish I would have done more advocating and education for myself. Hmm. How important is that when you look back now? How important is that now? Because I see you have a Facebook page and you do educate. How important is that to you now as far as education? It's it's very important for me as far as education because uh, if you can change your situation by changing something small, I would say do that. That's why I advocate so I can share my story to help someone else. Right, right. So when you see people like on the street or you tell somebody that you're on dialysis have have you ever been told you don't look like you're on dialysis all the time people tell me that all the time or when they see my um pd catheter tape right here they'd be like what is that is that a cyst or they'd be asking what that is i'm like no that's my pd catheter they'd be like wow you look good they always tell me i do not look sick wow wow yeah a lot of people out here who's dealing with kidney disease, say that. Um, so could you share with us the challenges and adjustments you faced since beginning peritoneal dialysis? What challenges have you've had? Um, I, let me, the first challenge is that I was used to sleeping on my stomach. Now I have to sleep on my side or my back. Um, another challenge for me is I, I, I'm always mindful of what I'm putting into my body. And um, you have to be I'm mindful of making sure I'm taking my medication, making sure your mental is right. Uh, just making sure uh, that I'm around positive people, but it is an emotional roller coaster. Um, for me, I'm, it's still new to me because I started this journey on November the 1st, and um, I had an emergency surgery because they had to go back in because my catheter moved around. So the fluid was going in, but it was not draining. Uh, my skin itches. Um, I feel nauseous sometimes. I have to get used to that. Uh, I can never get in. I'm always tired. Uh, let's see what else. My appetite has changed, like certain things. I just don't want to eat anymore. Um, yeah, it's a lot. All right. So you said you started in November. So pretty much you've been doing this for like three months. Yes. So you're still getting adjusted to it. I'm finally to the point to where no drain pain, because that was, that had me in shambles when I first felt that drain pain, that pain that you feel and it goes all the way through your body. Yeah. Mm, I hear several people talking about that. And that happens when the fluid is being drained out of your abdominal cavity. Yes. Yep. Wow. So how long were you in? Did you ever go in center and do dialysis in the clinic? No, the only time I went to the clinic is when I did all the training, but no. Okay, so that's something that a lot of people may not know. So when 
you got diagnosed. Did you did research to find out and they did surgery? You decided to do peritoneal dialysis before it got to the point to where you got if you got really sick that they would had to do emergency dialysis. Explain that 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 process, uh, because most people don't do that. They get diagnosed in the hospital. They get a catheter put in and they go straight to the uh, dialysis center. But in this case, you were able to divert going into the clinic, but go there for your training for PD and actually start your dialysis at home. Is that what I understand? Yes. Explain that process. How did how did it get to that point? So when my numbers were dropping and well, when everything was getting worse, see, my doctor gave me the option. She gave me all the options. Mm. Chemo, PD, and uh and clinic. And um she went over all of those, you know, options for me. And I said, I would like to do PD because I am um, mature enough and I have, I, you know, I take initiative. I'd be able to do my treatments at home because I'm serious about my health. So, and I was glad I decided to do the PD because that's been the best option for me. Bro, I mean, that... That's amazing. You said something very important that your doctor gave you treatment options. Do you know how that rarely happens? It, it happens, but I've been doing this four decades, just about four decades. And I've seen people in the hospital get diagnosed, come do the treatment, and most of the people get sent out to the dialysis clinic. They don't they don't get told about the treatment options until they get in the clinic. And that clinic may not even have home dialysis. I mean, it's so common. That's why you see all these clinics out here. And they're trying to push for home dialysis because no one's saying anything. No. And I'm thankful because of my best friend. And then she's always taught me to advocate for yourself. I had a kidney doctor, but, and people don't think this is real. And I'm just going to be to have a transparent moment. The doctor, the male doctor who I used to go to, I'm not going to call his name. He thought just because I was black that I can endure pain more than anybody else. Mm. And the way he treated me when I was telling him I was going through, mm. he was not listening. So I was like, when my, the doctor that came to saw, to see me when I was in the hospital, she was not my doctor. And I found out she was at the same clinic I was. I said, I want, that's who I want to be my doctor. And God worked it out to, she's my doctor. Yes. Talk about how important it is to advocate for yourself if you don't uh, particularly care for a uh, particular doctor. Because in, in, in actuality, we are the customers, so we should be able to choose who you want, correct? Correct. And I'm not like most people. I do my research. And see, Georgia is one of the states to where they have so many lawsuits against them, too, for just putting people on the houses and not trying to help them. Mm. And when I found that out, I was like, you know, I got to advocate for myself. When I, I asked my doctor... I'm the Dr. Smith. Many, many, many questions. She has never ever turned me down or made me feel less than. And um, if I'm not feeling right, I can call my nurse right now at eight, nine, ten o'clock on her personal number. She always picks up for me. You, that's you awesome. wanna, you need a good staff. You need somebody. You need people who care. And there's a lot of people in the healthcare. If they don't care, it, it shows. Yeah, you said something important that reminded me of a situation that, that happened yesterday. Uh, you mentioned that doctors in Georgia start patients on dialysis too soon. And 
I had a gentleman that I worked at a clinic yesterday and his GFR was 13%. And the daughter and the wife came. This, this was his first day. I mean, his first day, he didn't start in a hospital or none of that. And he is on chemotherapy as well. But 13%. And I know many people who are down to single digits that are not on dialysis yet. And the daughter thought that he was being started too early. And I was listening to a conversation when the doctor came in to see him before he started. He actually started treatment. I had to do the admission. And the daughter was like, we, you know, we don't think he should start. And the doctor's like, I think so. And he started, but I say that to say, advocate for yourself. If you don't feel like you should start, if you had 15, 12% and you don't have a lot of the symptoms and you still urinating, that may be something you may want to get a second opinion if starting right now or at a later time is in your best interest. But see, yes, av advocacy is really, really important. Um, and see, my Dr. Smith told me, she said, we're going to keep you off of this for as long as you can. And to see, you know, but when I went to that last appointment, it was, it, it she told me, we're going to keep you off. So a year later, that's when she told me, she said, you know, we got to start the process, baby. She said, it's going to, I know you're going to be scared, but she's going to, she said, it's going to be all right. Yeah. Mm. Wow. That sounds like a really special uh, nephrologist. She is. I love, I, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't ask for an, another doctor. Mm, mm, mm. So um, let me ask you, Zach. Um, here we go. Can you share with us? Uh, oh, I already talked about that. Uh, so how has peritoneal uh, dialysis affected your daily life and routine, uh, especially in uh, relation to your profession? Responsibilities. Uh. I I have not um, get a photo shoot yet. I used to do them often, and I have not went back to work yet because my body is still adjusting, and um, I'm tired, dizzy. You know, um, it's just it's hard, but I still find a way to um, to push through because I know that it's only going to be a certain period of time before my kidney comes. I'm just, I'm very optimistic when it comes to this. I don't let it get me down. It's all about your thought process as well. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned, we had a question from Miss Elizabeth Oham. Uh, she asked how long after diagnosis did you start dialysis? You said about a year yeah. after you were told you started. Yes, and it was a year, but before that year started, when I uh, got out of ICU, I completely changed the way I ate. I changed what I put inside of my body. That was a wake-up call. It was a wake-up call for me, being in ICU, and people don't realize the decisions that we make. It, it, it affected everybody around me. My mom, my dad, my sister, my friends, my loved ones. It affected everybody. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very important about the decisions that we make. And that's why I try to do these shows and uh, and, and really be uh, advocating when it comes to diabetes and hypertension because those are the, the two leading causes of, of this disease. Uh, let me ask you, Zach, what advice would you give uh, to others who are newly diagnosed or considering uh, peritoneal dialysis as a treatment option? I would say give peritoneal dialysis a try, but you're going to have to be diligent. You're going to have to be um, able to do it because nobody's going to be on your back. But the nurses mm -hmm. are able to see your levels from when they look at 
the treatment that you're doing, which they're going to teach you all about that in training. So I think it's worth it. Right. So basically you're saying if you do peritoneal dialysis at home, you really got to be intentional in doing it because you can easily get into a uh, a pattern of putting it off and maybe not doing it and not really being consistent with the with the treatment. Right. Have you found yourself in that situation when you first when started? I first, when I first started, because I was so scared and fearful of the unknown and the drain pain, it was just nothing I've never experienced before. So I was scared at first. And um, I thank God for my nurse practitioner and the nurse, everybody who has been helping me in the medical field. They have been sent by God because they have really helped me along the way. That's awesome. That's awesome. We had some comments on uh, TikTok. Uh, uh, Preset Bra said that's a supportive doctor to actually hear a patient. And also she uh, said PD does give more of a lifestyle freedom to some extent if you can follow through the procedures. So with that being said, uh, in what ways has your perspective on life and health changed since being diagnosed with kidney disease? And how do you remain positive and motivated despite the challenges? I remain positive because my best friend, I've watched her go through kidney failure. She started out on PD mm. and she kept getting the infections, but she was allergic to antibiotics. So she had to go in center. And I saw how strong she was. And I was there for her. And now she's there for me. So it's somewhat easy because I know what to expect. Wait a minute. <laughs> so you said you had a best friend that you was there for. You weren't even on dialysis. You was there for a best friend that was doing PD. And now she has a transplant and you're on dialysis and she's there for you like you was there for her. Yes. Uh, that is really ironic. I, I, yes. I mean, this is how this is what I try to tell people. This is how serious this disease is. And you have generations on dialysis. I worked in uh, North Carolina where at one clinic you had the granddaughter, the grandmother, and her mother all at the same facility. Three generations. So um, so how has your life changed? Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in what ways has your perspective on life and health changed since being diagnosed? I, I know you mentioned that after you got out the hospital, you, you uh, changed your life, you eat more healthy. What else uh, has changed since being diagnosed with kidney disease? What has changed for me is, is perspective. When I first had my first surgery, I learned that, you know, to be honest, tomorrow's not promised, so I'm living my life to the fullest. Um, I hold all things loosely, like all these material things I used to try to work hard and get, I don't care about that anymore. Mm. It's all about helping someone else, and it's all about being rich and in spirit and in health for me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us, uh, Zach, about any support systems uh, or resources that you have been particular that have been particularly helpful uh, for you as you navigate life with kidney disease and peritoneal dialysis. My my friends have been my support system. Um, my sister. Not even, and I, I'm going to be honest, because some of the, some, I know some people, 
you're not going to get the support from your family. And that's okay. As long as you have support from someone, that's all that matters to me. And um, my parents are still living. Me and my dad, we don't see eye to eye. He thought what I was going through was a joke until he came to one of my trainings with me. And then, boom, it hit him. He was like, this is real. This is serious. Yes, it is. So sometimes instead of saying, oh, you're going to be all right, just listen when that person is talking, especially if they're going through being on dialysis, because it's a lot. It's a up and down roller coaster. One day you're good, the next day you're not. One day you're fine, the next moment you're not. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have your machine near you? It's right here, yes. It's in oh. front of me. Oh, any way you can show us the um, machine? Or if not, that's okay. Let's see. Let me. I don't know if you can, y'all, can you see it? Oh, okay. So that's, and that's the, uh, the bag on top is the, the solution that goes into your stomach. Yes, and it's the bag right here. I use two bags. Oh, okay. Okay. So if you see a lot of the Baxter boxes, oh, yeah. like, so <laughs> how much space does uh, your supplies take up? It takes up a lot of space. <laughs> <laughs> but you you have it in your bedroom, so uh, it's pretty more compacted in one area for you to navigate. Exactly, yes. Okay, okay. I know that's a problem for many people is the space because of the many boxes that come along uh, with that. Yes, and my nurses really taught me how to, to do an order because some people... They'll just keep sending you an overflux of stuff. So. Oh, yeah. really? Mm-hmm. Wow. Right. I'm, I'm sure that could be uh, overwhelming getting the, every week, getting a lot of medical supplies and, you know, yes. you're backed up and don't really need it. And they still send in the same uh, supplies. You end up with five boxes of alcohol or something like that. Yes. Wow. Um, let me ask you, Zach, what are your hopes and aspirations for the future, both personally and professionally, while managing your kidney health with peritoneal dialysis? Um, with peritoneal dialysis, I want to be able to speak to people and let them know that, you know, you follow the directions, ask questions, and if you do what you're supposed to do, you know, good things are happening because I'm I, I am I'm on the kidney transplant list, and professionally, I just want to be able to work back in my field. I really want to do work for like um, the fashion weeks because I'm I'm creative directing and makeup and stuff like that. So that's what I really want to do. But I also want to be able to share my story because people. I just want to be able to be relatable and reach people and be real and transparent because that's what a lot of people need, somebody just to be real and transparent mm -hmm. but about now, what they're going through. Now, how long did your training take to learn the, peritoneal dialysis? The training day, I went to training for, it's between six to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. and, and mine was six weeks. And what I did like about my nurses who trained me, if I did need a little bit more time, they said, you can you can do another week or two if you need it. And I was able to call them because getting the machine home first is overwhelming. I remember I called my nurse every day for like maybe the first two weeks and we FaceTime. She picked up the phone. She walked me through it. She didn't ever make me feel like I was dumb or stupid. She just always make me feel like you're going to get better and it's going to be okay. Hey, Jen. Uh, Jen Benson said, hello, Zach. She's, hello. Uh, yeah. she's a kidney warrior herself and also CEO of Transplant Journey uh, organization. So she's a 
transplant. I mean, she's a, a kidney and pancreas recipient, and she's okay. doing very well, very well. So um, now you have a Facebook page, and you have several videos on there where you pretty much share your journey. Um, what what inspired you to do that? Because many people, when they get hit with a chronic illness, pretty much keep it to themselves and not document that. But what uh, motivated you to share your your journey? Well, what motivated me was uh, this has always been my motto ever since I was little transparency and I don't do secrets or lies. So I just want to be able to share my story just to help somebody else because a lot of people, a lot of people suffer in silence and I just want to be that voice to have someone just to look at me and be like, if he can make it, so can I. It, it may be rough, but you gonna make it. You gonna be okay. Tell yourself you are gonna be okay. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you that. Before being diagnosed um, with kidney disease, you said you had a friend that was dealing with this. Did when you was um, assisting your best friend, did you know the magnitude of of kidney disease, the impact that it had on uh, the minority community? I did not, not until, not until she was, not until I dealt with her diagnosis. Yes, mm -hmm. I didn't. So you was just going on about your, what you normally do your everyday life and really didn't have like a clue of the uh, impact that this disease has, has caused. Right. Because in my mind, I was like, not me, not I, but yeah, it happened to me. <laughs> Do you know other people outside your best friend that's dealing with uh, kidney failure, kidney disease? I know um, one other lady. She's in the same, well, she's um, in the same city that I used to live in. She's dealing with it, but she goes in center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Now, Zach, you said that hypertension caused your uh, kidney disease, correct? Correct. Okay. So, yes, Jen Benson had asked that question. Yeah, I know you had mentioned it in the beginning. So, yeah, and like I said, diabetes and hypertension are the two leading causes of, of kidney disease. And in the southern states, Jack, Zach is out of Georgia, but Georgia ranks in the top 10 of state high with kidney disease that's impacted. Um, so Zach, uh, let me ask you, how do you prior how you, I'm sorry, prioritize self-care and maintain a healthy mindset? How I just remain positive. Um, I don't really be around negative people. Um, I take care of myself the best that I can. I watch what I eat. Of course, I, I indulge in certain things, but not like I used to. I gave up caffeine. I gave up things that were not good for me. I try not to drink drinks that are red or food that is high in phosphorus. I try not to intake in all of that. So I just do the best I can. Um, on a daily basis, and um, I just take it day by day. Mm. Do you still, like, go out and just do regular activities that you were doing before um, dealing with kidney failure? Like, you go to the movies or uh, go out to eat despite having to do uh, peritoneal? Yes, I still do um, the same things I was doing. Not as often, but I still do them. Now, 
this I'm going to like I'm going my best friend she lives in Texas I'm going to go see her for two weeks soon so this will be my really my first time traveling and being on PD that's another thing I love about PD because I'm able to go so I'm able to go see her for two weeks and be able to do my treatment without no worries yeah so um Jim wants to know, I know we talked about this on camera, but Jim Benson asked, was the hypertension never addressed by your doctor? Did you crash into dialysis or were you referred to a nephrologist to try and prevent dialysis? Yes, I was referred to a nephrologist first because my doctor saw my um, uh numbers i i don't know if she said if they were rising or they were dropping but she was like your kidneys are um not looking too good i want to i want to send you to a uh yeah so so jen basically um what happened you weren't here in the beginning but uh uh zach first dealt with hypertension and he uh stopped taking his medicine and what happened he got back on it and that's when he was referred to the nephrologist and he didn't crash into dialysis the nephrologist he had one that he didn't like and he found another one he was in icu and he found another doctor that he liked and she kept him off dialysis for a year and during that time he did research and found out about peritoneal so he never went in center. He did the peritoneal training and went right, started right at home on peritoneal instead of going in center. So he definitely got the education from his nephrologist. Uh, she kept him off as, as long as she could. So, uh, and, and that's, I mean, you had a great nephrologist because as I mentioned, Zach, a lot of nephrologists don't do that. They try to, you know, get you to go straight in center. Don't tell you about the different treatment options. Um, yeah, Jen said good doctors are hard to find. And that, that's what I tell people. If you're not satisfied with the nephrologist or um, primary care that you have, seek a second opinion because yes. we're the consumers. Uh, they don't pick us, we pick them. And I think that's where a lot of people may be uh, happy because they're probably dealing with a family doctor or doctor for a long time. But if you're not happy with a certain decision and you feel, you know, a difference of opinion, then I definitely encourage to uh, change uh, doctors or find someone else to talk to. Um so Zach, can you share with us uh, a message? Well, lastly, can you share a message of encouragement for others living with uh, kidney disease and undergoing peritoneal dialysis based on your experience and insights? I will say you have to surround yourself with your loved ones and that could be friends or family because I'm thankful for my friends and family because I had to have an emergency surgery. And uh, this was my first time being put to sleep. I got put to sleep twice. And the fear of the unknown is there. And you're going to be on an emotional roller coaster. It's going to be some days to where I have to lay down and be like, you know, I got to start over again tomorrow. But just know, I've always been taught that the sun will shine. And you just always have to look toward a better day. Um, I know I have kidney failure, but I'm very optimistic, very positive. I speak life. I don't let nobody speak negative into my life or over me. You just have to surround yourself with good people. If you just have that one person, that's fine but you have to surround yourself with people who love and care for you. You have to care for yourself too as well. I agree. I agree. So let me ask you a question. And that was very well said. Thank you. 
Um, when you, during the time that you found out you had kidney disease and it was kind of declining, did you search out or see anything online about herbal teas or, or reverse kidney damage or any detoxification to fix your kidneys? Did you run into any of that on social media? I did. Um, I've, I've even tried some herbal teas. Tell, I went tell to, us about your experience with that and, and what happened. I went to the I went to this uh, one place and spent a whole bunch of money on the herbal teas. And for me, it 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 didn't it didn't work well for me. Um, my experience with that it wasn't good. Cause I did it for like six months. I just kept putting into my body, putting it into my body with no results. And sometimes you just have to be, have to be mindful about the natural herbs and all this stuff you put into your body. Cause everything is different for everybody. Do I do, do I still do some holistic things like juicing and all that sometimes? Or take certain supplements if I can, yes. But you just have to always keep in mind, do what's best for you. And it was, I realized it wasn't best for me. Mm. Yes, I, I just wanted to address that because when you go on social media, you see a lot of um, information out there on herbal teas, detoxification, and that it can reverse this or reverse that. And I just wanted to ask that question for people to hear from someone that said they actually tried it. And unfortunately, you still ended up having to do kidney dialysis. And one thing they try to tell you to do is to stop taking your medicine. Now, I need y'all to use wisdom with that. Don't ever stop just not taking your medicine. Use wisdom take keep taking your meds but you have to use wisdom when it comes to certain things because mm. sometimes people are not being honest with this whole holistic thing they're not even doing it themselves mm -hmm. they're so not dealing with the careful. disease exactly right and so that's what <laughs> i try to advocate as well because as i mentioned you see this all across social media especially on TikTok, and I try to help prevent people from taking that route. Or if you're going to take that route, do your due diligent research. Because if not, it's possible you could do more harm than, than good. And so, yeah, and Jen says, please use reputable sources with all those teas and supplements. Absolutely. You definitely have to do your research. So, Zach, you mentioned um, you're on the transplant list. Uh, what hospital are you on the transplant list at? I'm on the transplant list, um, um, Piedmont, and then I know I'm in the. I'm going to be on the transplant list in Birmingham. And one thing I do love about my doctor, she gave me more than one option. She gave me options and. Uh, she gives me physicians that she trusts and that she has to work with. Like my um, my surgeon that put my PD catheter in, he's one of the best. And mm. they work together and it, 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 it's just very important. It's very important. Wow. Wow. How important is, is um, your support system like your family? I know you mentioned a lot about them in your videos, how important your friends and family are during uh, your time you was in the hospital. It's very, it was important to me because going through something as difficult as this and the unknown, you're gonna need people who are there for you and care about you just to come around and support you and be there for you. Everybody, all of my close friends were in the waiting room with me. They stayed there with me. 
the hours. They made sure I was good. And it, it's just, I, I can, I'm always thankful for that. It's very important. Mm -hmm. Very important. Yes, yeah. yeah, Jen uh, said UAB is excellent. I, I forgot to mention that I'm Jen- She told me about that one too. I forgot about that one, but yes. Yes, uh, she's an expert at helping people find uh, transplant centers and getting on the list and navigating that whole transplant journey process. That's why the name of her organization is Transplant Journey, but she's a wizard at helping people uh, get transplants. And uh, Minister Willie Blackwell, thank you, uh, Minister, I mean, Elder Blackwell for coming on. Uh, he's an advocate as well. He's out of Atlanta, may not exactly be Atlanta, but he's out of Georgia and ex NFL player, uh, transplant advocate recipient. And he says, Pete, my hospital is very good. They did his transplant in 2022. And that's Elder Willie Blackwell. He's on Facebook as well. He's very open and helpful so if you want to reach out to him just for any um guidance or anything very positive uh person he's actually been on the podcast as well several years ago um yeah very very great gentleman elder blackwell so um that's where he got his transplant at piedmont so you got two three different hospitals, man, uh, in, in your favor. And that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, uh, now I appreciate you reaching out to me on, on TikTok. And if anyone else is, uh, wants to come on the show and share their story, uh, please reach out to me because we would love to hear it and see how you're dealing with, uh, kidney disease and kidney failure. Oh, he says, uh, excuse me, Elder Blackwell says he's already helped two people get a transplant. I seen one. He got a video. I can't think of the gentleman's name, but uh, it was a school teacher. And, and they had it on video where they found a, a match for him. Can't think of the gentleman's name. It's on the tip of my tongue, Elder Blackwell. If you can mention I would appreciate it but that was a very touching story because the guy got surprised by uh the donor at at the school <laughs> so very very touching uh as I was saying uh Zach I definitely appreciate you reaching out on on TikTok and I hope you continue to uh, share your story, advocate, and educate um, about peritoneal dialysis, especially on uh, TikTok. Like, I don't know if you ever go live and share what you do um, as far as your treatment process, but that would be great to see. Because there, there are um, other people that go live that do their treatment online i mean on live yes i got to get more followers to go live so oh, i don't have okay. enough followers but as soon as i get my followers up i'm gonna go start going live doing my treatments so guys if you're watching this from TikTok, <laughs> go uh follow zach love uh so we can get him to a thousand followers to to start sharing his story and uh advocacy Oh, Willie Blackwell said it was uh, Leon Hammonds and Mr. This this new Duretti. So these are the two people he helped get a, a transplant. And hopefully, he maybe could be some assistance to you. But like you said, you're already on the list. So uh, are you looking for a living donor, or it doesn't matter? It. For me, it just doesn't matter. Okay, okay. Yeah. Jim Benson, wishing you much luck and success uh, along your journey. Yes. Uh, Zach. Thank you. Yes. 
Absolutely. So uh, with that being said, man, I'm about to end the show. But again, Zach, thank you for coming on and sharing your experience, uh, strength and hope with kidney disease and peritoneal dialysis. I hope that this show uh, helps encourage someone else that's about to go through uh, this process because each year, 750,000 people are diagnosed with kidney disease, kidney failure. So I hope this uh, show reaches someone that can help them make a decision to uh, do home dialysis and get uh, strength from your story. And so look forward to seeing you on TikTok and on uh, social media, Zach. And if you ever want to come back on and share any uh, information or uh, anything, show us the process of peritoneal, like you starting from the beginning and going through the process of hooking up, please reach out to me. I'll be more than welcome uh, to share that educational piece because that would be definitely a great teaching tool. Okay. All right. With that being said, I'm going to drop you and uh, look forward to seeing you on social media. Again, thank you for coming on Kidney Disease Education Show, and uh, we'll see you soon, Zach, and have a good evening. Have a good evening. All right, you too. Thank you. You're welcome. So, guys, this has been a great show with Isaac Love Raleigh Jr., uh, a.k.a. Zach Love, PD Warrior. Hello, Angela. Uh, Thank you for tuning in. Uh, You just missed the show. I'm about to close down. Also, shout out to Jim Benson of Hashtag Transplant Journey on social media. Also, go to her page if you're a kidney warrior, if you're watching this on TikTok or this broadcast. And if you're on the transplant list or you're thinking about it and you don't know where to turn, reach out to Jen Benson of transplantjourney.org. She can definitely uh, uh, nav- help navigate you through the correct process of getting on the transplant list. She then helped hundreds of people navigate the process and even help many get that gift of life. So she's a, a definitely, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Uh, uh, a very handy uh, piece of information in the kidney space to know. So if anyone wants to be on the show to share their story, please reach out to me uh, through Facebook or TikTok. I want to thank uh, Elder Blackwell for coming on. Uh, Miss Elizabeth Oldham, uh, Angela Purell and anyone else who watched the show from YouTube, Facebook, or TikTok. Uh, With that being said, uh, look forward to next Sunday for uh, Kidney Hub East Africa with myself and Moses Kennedy next Sunday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 8 p.m. East African time. With that being said, thank you guys. Have a great evening and we will see you soon. I want to close out with an important ESA. Hello, I'm Darren. We have breaking news. More than 600,000 Americans have kidney failure. While the number of people with kidney failure is enormous, the number of people with its precursor, chronic kidney disease, is staggering. An estimated 31 million Americans, or about 10% of the US population. Diabetes and hypertension cause two thirds of all cases of kidney disease. One out of every three Americans is at risk for kidney disease, and kidney disease is now among the top 10 causes of death in the United States. In addition, 9 out of 10 people with early to moderate kidney disease don't know they have it, putting their health in jeopardy. Are you at risk? 
For more information, contact urbankidneyalliance.org. The life you save may be yours.